Good evening, and welcome to another edition of Jeeva Live. I have a great guest and show for you tonight. Uh, we have in the house, Dustin Watton. Dustin, thank you for joining us this evening. My pleasure, excited for this conversation. Awesome, uh, and he's here to talk to us about something that is without a doubt near and dear to his heart, um, something we hear a lot of people talk about, but you know, we maybe not know too much about it, or we think we do, but I think it's a great chance to talk tonight about growth mindset. And the, the catchphrase that I hear a lot of people use right now and in this current pandemic situation is, you know, how do I make today the best day ever, even when I feel like sometimes it's not that great? How can I grow and create this growth mindset? So let's, you know, start up and back up a little bit. Um, Dustin, how are you doing tonight? Unbelievable. Luckily, it's still daytime here. Uh, the first time in a while I've seen the sun, I spent this last year in Poland, but, uh, yeah, as you say, you know, navigating the waters right now, you know, a lot of stuff, um, uh, kind of going against my personal preferences or how I believe the summer, uh, would be, but you know what, all that stuff, it's not completely within my control. And so just pivoting and as I've done in my career, uh, realizing, you know, what the truth is, accepting it, surrendering to the reality around me. And then just finding ways to be more creative, more intentional, more mindful uh, with the number one goal to, to be of service, especially to younger athletes and coaches at this time. Fair enough. Yeah, I know we in the Jiva region and the rest of the volleyball community definitely enjoy and appreciate your time right now. So, you know, let's start with just some basic backgrounds. You know, when I read your bio, you know, even some of your um, your self imposed or professed ideas about yourself. You call yourself a quote unquote, I used to be the B team player. Um, I wasn't that good at volleyball. It's something I've heard you say before too. And that kid who was a B team player becomes an all American libero and has the chance to play in Poland and work with the U S national team and, you know, is going further and further every single day. You know, where does your story start with volleyball and where is it going to go to next? Yeah, I think like most athletes, you know, I got a pretty late start. Uh, I wanted nothing to do with volleyball. My dad coached a little bit. He played a little bit. And it was always on the table. Do you want to play volleyball? And growing up in Southern California, of course, it's popular. Where I grew up in Long Beach, California, not so popular with boys. So my dad offered me, do you want to play volleyball? And ah, that's a girl sport. Go to high school. And uh, the varsity coach offered my dad to coach the freshman team. And once again, no, it's a girl's sport. <laughs> but in middle school, what happened was uh, all my friends went here. I went here. I had no friends. And pretty much throughout high school, I really didn't have any friends. Uh, but you know what? It worked out in my favor. Because um, I figured out a lot of my friends from the soccer team or a lot of my teammates from the soccer team were going to go out for the volleyball team. And was, this is a chance to make some friends. So I played volleyball. Uh, my dad was the coach. Super hard on me, but in a compassionate way. Uh, we won more league, freshman more league, not a big deal, but it felt like a big deal. And then from there, I was able to make a, a local club team, Nova, on the 16s two team. And super stoked, super fired up. And then from there, I realized I was going to go to this tournament called JOs. What's JOs? I figured out Junior Olympics and uh, couldn't stop patting myself on the back. How great am I going to Junior Olympics? So I end up at Junior Olympics. I think that year is in Arizona. Nike armbands on my sleeve. Just, I don't know what those are supposed to do, but fired up. And uh, the last game of the tournament, we lost to a team from Maryland, sealing our fate as the worst place team in JOs. And so after that, I realized three things. One, I love volleyball. Oh, amazing. You know, just the small moments of uh, just brilliance, you know, making a perfect back set, diamond a pass, pancake. Amazing, right? But two, I realized I'm not very good at volleyball. In fact, probably one of the worst athletes at my age. And so three, I've always had this naive belief that with hard work, you know, you can accomplish anything. And so from then I got, I got to work. And again, having no friends, you know, what initially I felt was like awful turned out to be one of the best things in the skies because every morning I went, jumped in the van with my dad, went to Huntington beach, got whooped by uh, Butch May and some of his older buddies that were around 50, 60 at the time. And just kept on losing and losing and losing and losing and losing. I go home, taught my brother how to pepper. When he got tired, hit the ball off the wall, hit the ball off the gutter, hit the ball off the stairs. Uh, I go inside. I drew a bullseye in my house, set myself, set the bullseye, and I just kept on playing. I just kept on playing. And when I was younger, that's all I knew. It was just will. 
And that's what I gave every second, every day I gave my will uh, to the sport of volleyball. Awesome. No, thank you for that. You know, and I think, you know, you took something that could have been a really hard situation and not doing so great at junior you know, nationals there with that 16s two team, but you remember those, those little moments of success and you built on those. And it, my guess is those little moments of success somehow pins into your mind and just, you kept getting that craving, that dopamine injection in your brain to just, I want to get better. I want to get better. I love this sport. And then you figured out ways at home to, you know, be creative and create contraptions or hit against the wall or teach your family member how to play. That sounds like something we can do now. So, you know, with, you know, all this free time I have in the pandemic situation, you know, what did, you know, what can a kid do to have that creative growth mindset right now? Or what advice would you give to them in this situation? Yeah, I would actually advise them to not do anything I did as a kid. Because as a kid, when I was a kid, that was the best of my knowledge. As I learned as a professional, you know, will can only take you so far. And when I failed as a professional, which pretty much every year I find myself kind of on my butt looking around like, am I going to get a contract for next year? Because as a foreign libero, you're the last person taken on the team, right? And not only that, but I had to compete against foreign liberos from Argentina, sometimes from Brazil, from Serbia, Bulgaria, you know, all over the world, there's foreign liberals trying to make it in Europe. And in these times of failures, setbacks, and roadblocks, I've had to pivot, you know, realizing the way I was working before was not good enough. I wasn't skilled enough to continue playing at a high level. And so throughout my career, I found better ways to train. And I think during this time, there's a lot of ways where we can train. And of course, if you want to touch the ball, Great, like have at it. But if you believe that that's going to leave you as prepared and confident as possible when you step on the court, I would disagree. Uh, and so right now, there's a lot of ways to go growth mindset, right? Uh, watching the best players in the world. Huge. Because when we watch this, now we become curious for a better style. It's not a duality, like good pass, bad pass. It's like, oh, that player is always stepping back. That player is always moving back. That player looks so strong with his legs. And just being curious to how they play the game. Journaling every day with intention, right? Rather than leaving your day up to chance, which most of the time we're not going to be intentional because we have these devices that are programmed to not only get our attention, but to keep our attention. So starting off with intention, what's our purpose for the day? And at the end of the day, confronting ourselves with what was the biggest challenge and what did we learn from it? What do we want to do differently for tomorrow? So as quick as possible, we're finding the problems and switching it to a solution, growth mindset. It's like a sneaky way of uh, tricking kids into being more growth mindset just by filling out a piece of paper every day. And then on top of that, you know, learning more about the mental side, reading some books, learning about creating space in between uh, stimulus and response is space. How much space do we have? Do we react? One big thing when I talk about uh, when I talk to younger clubs, you know, if you start off a game with four perfect passes, four perfect passes on that fifth ball, that fifth serve, you're probably like, Come on, you know, give me the ball. Like, I got this all day. Maybe the first three serves are aces. And maybe it wasn't even your fault. Hits the tape, ace. Hits the line, ace. Hits the tape again, ace. On that fourth ball, how are you coming back? What's your, what's your level of focus, of confidence, of presence? And so I always like using the analogy, uh, if you have a glass of eight-ounce water and a tablespoon of sugar, put that in the drink, how does it affect it? It affects it a lot, right? Same thing, same teaspoon, put that in the ocean. How does that affect it? Probably not a lot. And so we have the ability right now to work on our mindfulness, to work on meditation, and to increase the space between stimuli and response. Fair enough. So let me, um, I'm curious, what is, so the viewers at home are fully on the same page, and I assume most are, but I want to make sure, what is your definition or the definition you use of growth mindset versus a fixed mindset? Just so we're all on the same page. Absolutely. Yeah. Great question. And so growth mindset is this belief that, you know, whatever happens, we're going to learn from it. We're going to get better. And it engages us to put ourselves at risk, to play at a higher level, to play against better players knowing that even if we fail, it's going to be all right because not only are we going to learn from it, but we're going to see the opportunity to growth and we're going to see the truth 
where we're at as athletes right now and how we can pivot and be more intentionally training going forward. And so it could be as simple as playing beach. Are you playing AAU against people your age or are you playing against adults knowing that you're going to lose and probably not make it out of pool, pool play? Fixed mindset. It's very dangerous. And luckily, growing up, I was in this growth set. Uh, we talked before. My parents would always say that they were proud of how I competed. That's a big thing, right? Because how I compete is completely within my control. If they were saying, we're proud of how you won, it's great when I win, right? But I can't control if my team wins. I can't even have complete control of how I play. There's a lot of other factors. And so we're leaving our happiness, uh, our ability to feel whole, our ability to feel love up to chance. And so with fixed mindset, it's our pursuit of an outcome. And most of the time, that outcome isn't completely within our control, and it becomes very dangerous. And this is where you see burnout in athletes, because if they lose, 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 eventually they're going to get to a point where it's just like, I just, I'm not happy because I'm not winning because I don't feel loved. And you also see uh, burnout because athletes in a fixed mindset, win, 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 feel good, feel good, feel good. Now they start losing when they go up a higher level, and they are just like, well. I guess my time has run out and I'm just not that good. And so the best thing ever happened to me was to lose at jails to get last place because the only way I could go was up. And with my parents, the most important factor and the only factor in the love I got from them was how I competed. And that was completely within my control. Fair enough. Yeah. And I think, I mean, God, there's so many ways we can go in this conversation right now. My mind is all over the place and I love it. Because this is just stuff I love to talk to about, you know, sports psychology and just being a good coach. So I guess the best next question I can ask is, how do I teach a player as a coach to understand their sphere of influence and control the controllables and stop worrying about the things you can't and to focus on only those things you can? What do I say to them? How do I get them to see that? You bring me in. You bring me in as a designated hitter. Uh, yeah. And so during this time, you know, like just pivoting, I, I started reaching out to, to club coaches that I knew and I wanted to go with their uh, and meet with their kids about reception and go over video. I wanted to shift the perspective, you know, of learning rather than scarcity during this time. Uh, a funny thing happened is college coaches started reaching out to me and they're like, hey, I know you're doing this, but. I would love to pay you to come and speak to our kids about mindfulness. And it's like, yeah, you know, that's one thing I would love to talk about. I'm finally able to use my communication degree as uh, <laughs> in real life. But uh, the big thing is talking to these coaches, because I'll jump on a call phone for, you know, 30 minutes before. And, you know, it's not new. You know, there's a lot of great coaches out there that understand the importance of mindfulness, of intention, and all these edges that we can use outside of the court to bring back, help the athletes get the most out of their training and help them be as prepared and confident when they step on the court and more resilient when things don't go their way. But the thing is, and I hear this from all the coaches and I'm guilty of it too. When I was younger, because my dad was a coach, it's the athletes are like, all right, mom, all right, dad, like I get it. I should journal. Gosh, you know? And the coaches are like, I know it's, this is works for you. Like, just listen, but you know, athletes are still developing. Their egos are still developing. Their brains are still developing. And so the ego is like, nah, you don't tell me what to do. You know, you don't tell me yeah. what to do. Like, Hey, breathe, 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 breathe. They're like, no. And so <laughs> I, I'm joking, but I'm serious in that when I come in and I start talking to the athletes, I'm not coming in to teach them or to tell them what to do. I'm coming in as their equal. Because when I come in, I share my background as a low level, skinny, short, goofy, long haired kid who didn't even make the fat 50, by the way, had to walk on at Long Beach. And even after a pretty good career at Long Beach, I didn't even get a professional contract. It took me four years to get into my first super league. And so when I talk to these kids, I don't talk about my successes. I don't talk about being World Cup champion because now it puts me above them. And I don't want to play that role of professional player, of teacher. I want to play the role of equal. And I want to share my stories of, you know what? I love volleyball and I'm passionate about it. And I'm always curious about a better day. And there's so many times where even with the best of my abilities and the best of my knowledge, I failed. 
And so upon rising, because that's the first important thing, we have to get up, right? We have to get up. I love, I love the, the Japanese proverb, um, fall seven, rise eight, right? We have to get up. But upon getting up, it's up to us to be more creative, more mindful, and more intentional. And that's where the growth has happened for me in my failures and my setbacks. And so the big thing when I talk to clubs, it's like, hey, failbacks are great. The biggest teachers, it's the truth. And what do we want? We want the truth because now we can recalibrate and change and be a better version of ourselves because we have that truth. But getting up, we have to change. We're going to repeat the same outcomes. That's insanity, right? Having an outcome that doesn't go our way, but still repeating the actions that had led to that outcome. And so for me, you know, I want to share my stories as an equal and also hammer down the points that the club or the coaches feel that are important to their athletes growth and their ability to overperform. And that has been really exciting for me to, to be able to add to the environment that so many of these great coaches are doing with their teams and using this time to talk about the extra edges we can get outside the court. Fair enough. No, great point. Now you alluded to some other things too. And we talked about this before the show and I actually had a side discussion uh, last night, actually with a sports psychologist. And we talked about the, how important we frame our language to people, to students, to players is just in general. And the idea we talked about before and last night was when I talk to a player, I can't tell them they're a bad player, quote unquote. I can tell them that maybe a particular action or behavior they did was incorrect or bad, but saying they are an awful player, a bad player, not a good person, you know, those are the things they hear sometimes. And I don't think we intentionally say that as coaches, but to our players, that's how sometimes it comes across. And we end up attacking the person and not the behaviors or the skills we want to work on. So how do we as coaches become more mindful of the language we use? How should I pose that language as a coach to my player so I don't attack them as an individual, but instead, you know, get that outcome of behavior or skill I want? Meditate. Meditate. Increase the space in between stimulus and response. Uh, I played for Alan Knight and when I was there, you know, you could see when Alan was not happy, you know, he, you know, get his hands, he's like all his broken fingers and crinch them up. You can see now, and you know, they've made a huge change over there at Long Beach and that's why they're so successful, but just pushing deep into mindfulness and the ability to respond. And I think the most important thing to make a correction without making the player wrong. Because it's so easy as our egos, you know, like you're wrong. And, you know, because you're wrong, I'm right. And it makes us feel good, but that's a reaction. And we need to be able to respond. And with more space, with a bigger emphasis in meditating, uh, maybe doing yoga, uh, being able to journal, being more conscious, we're able to have that space between, you know, someone acting up, someone doing something we told them consistently not to do, and then creating the space that aligns us to present a message that uh, most coincides with how we want to coach, teach, and I think most importantly, lead. Because I don't think anyone that's watching this wants to lead with an iron fist. We want to lead through love, support, and trust. Because when you have that trust, the kids will run through a wall. But at the same time, I want to be there for teams, and give them the knowledge so they can run over that wall. Mm -hmm. I agree. Well said. Yeah. It's, you know, as coaches, I think we just need to be way more mindful of, you know, how we talk to our athletes, how we pose that. Um, you know, I agree, you know, meditation is a great thing. Self-reflecting journaling is, is incredibly powerful when used deliberately and mindfully. So then it, it poses the question, what's in Dustin's journal or what things are your go-to writings and reflections that you write down? I can share. I can share. I actually, uh, that you're uh, willing to share on, on, on oh, your oh, broadcast. No, I mean, I'll, I'll share the format I use. So over <laughs> the past, uh, you know, maybe five years, I started journaling, you know, seeking out every edge I can find. And uh, I just decided to create my own journal using some from, you know, different journals. So there's two different parts. And uh, the first part, three things that I'm grateful for today. Uh, big thing. It's not that our cup is full. It's not that it's half full. It's that we have a cup that we have a cup and the abundance already around us. 
rather than craving for something outside of us to enter our life to make us feel whole. And that's where we get in a trap. And this attachment to something that we don't have yet, and that creates more suffering and takes away from our clarity, energy, and our time pursuing things that will help us grow. And so once we realize we have that cup, let's fill it up with intentional living, right? So what will be my focus or intention today? Usually I take this towards a uh, training. So maybe I want to work today on going hard in every seam. It doesn't matter, you know, if it's my bow or not, but I'm going to go in every seam. Uh, I'm going to work on holding my platform. I'm going to work on uh, my ability to pursue every ball on defense. Doesn't matter where it is, I'm going to pursue. I'm going to work on uh, getting extra reps after practice today. So it's something that's in my control, my focus or attention. And uh, we'll go even a little further. Three actions or tasks that are completely within my control. So I'm going to wake up and meditate today. Uh, I'm going to journal. I'm going to get to practice early. I'm going to watch hitter tape on the other team. Uh, I'm going to stay extra and work with my coach today. I'm going to limit my social media to one hour. All these things that we deep down inside already know if we accomplish these, it will align with our growth. But too often we leave the day up for chance. And once in a while, you know, I'll get a phone call. Hey, come here. Hey, do this. Or maybe I'm on my uh, Instagram and I, I get caught for two hours. You know, I just lost the day. I lost the chance to get better instead of getting better two, three, four percent, you know, maybe I just didn't get better at all. So three tasks. Um, and at the end of the day, I think one of the most important things is, you know, being, being clear, even if we feel we didn't take a huge step towards our growth, that we took a step. And so volleyball and, uh, Knight talks about this a lot. It's a, a pursuit of perfection in an imperfect sport, right? And as athletes, we're so hard on ourselves. When I started journaling, I was with the national team and, uh, yeah, I wasn't perfect, but you know what? I'm receiving balls from Matt Anderson, Michael Christensen, and Max Holt. You know, <laughs> the best servers in the world, but I still fully, I still believe I should be perfect. And when I wasn't perfect, which is all the time, I leave practice like, oh, nothing went well. This is awful. Uh, so three, three actions or, or three things that I'm most proud of today. So even if I had an awful practice, nothing went right. Because again, we can't control how well we practice. So I could say... You know, I got to practice early and got extra reps. I was relentless on defense today. I went for every ball. And, uh, you know, I was a great teammate. I was a great communicator. So maybe I got aced on every single serve, but I'm still finding things I did well today. And I can look back and be like, yeah, you know, I'm making steps towards my growth. Mm -hmm. uh, but, of course, we still need to be honest, right? We still need to be honest with ourselves. So what was the greatest test today? What was the greatest test? Maybe it was float serves. I, get, I kept on getting beat high on float serves. Uh, what did I learn from it? Uh, I got to get more work on float serves. You know, I got to be better tracking the ball. I need to get more work. What do you want to improve tomorrow? Uh, I want to work on float serve passing. Uh, that's what I need to work on. I had trouble today on float serve passing. So again, honest with ourselves. Here's the, here's the challenge. Here's the biggest issue today. And as quickly as possible, us ourselves, we're not waiting for a coach because as athletes, you know, we're so dependent, even as a professional coach, where do I be coach? What do I do coach? When, you know, we're not creating our own path to greatness. And so from here, problem solution as quickly as possible. What do I want to prove tomorrow? Close surpassing. What can I do differently tomorrow? Uh, I'm going to get to practice early and I'm going to work on balls that are high in creating the space. Maybe it's with my hips, maybe it's with my feet, but boom, just like that problems and solution. And the last question is, RSF and it's a ranking scale from one to 10 and RSF is relentless solution focus. So this was developed by Jason Selp and talks about how quick are we when we find problems or challenges in our life to reframe them into solutions. And so I used to pass with the guy in the national team and he would always kind of bail out on the scene. Right. And as a libero, that's my ace. And so when I was competing for a spot, like I was the second libero, I was going back and forth with the third guy. It was like, come on, man. Like you always in my mind, I'm like you always do that. Now it's my ace. Now I have worse stats. The coach saw that I've only passed two balls today. I'm not going to play in the next drill. I don't know if I'm going to make the trip. You know, I just start catastrophizing, you know, mm -hmm. uh, that's the stimulus. And I start catastrophizing. I get caught up in this tornado and uh, I started doing this. And at first I was like a four or a five. And at the end, like at the end of the summer, I was like a nine and 10, just like that, just by being conscious of it. So same thing would happen. And I'd be like, you know, like I have, I'd be tough on myself, but at the same time, have self-compassion. Like Dustin, you know that he does that. 
you know, fix it. Just go behind. Uh, you know, you can correct him without making him wrong. Be a little more clear in communication. And you know what? Going forward, just always go behind him. And knowing that he bails out on the ball a lot, go behind him every time and you know you got it. And the most important thing is I need to move on to the next ball. I need to regather my thoughts, get out from the tornado, get into the eye of the tornado, that calm, centered space where I can gather up as much confidence and focus and clarity that I had before that ball rather than letting the problems just destroy my ability to focus and be confident for that next serve, because that's the most important ball, the next ball. Yep. Now, I think you've already alluded to something that I'm curious on, if you'll elaborate on even more, is the, the idea of positive self-talk. And you just kind of did it in your, in your last little part of discussion, going through that anecdote. You know, I have to build myself up. There might be nobody else except for me that's going to do that in that moment of time. And you've already explained to us in part how important it was to you in that one situation. But, you know, what would you do to, you know, what would you tell a player? And on the other side, what would you tell a coach listening to how do you teach one of your players to positively promote their internal self to fill up their emotional tank when nobody else is around to do so? And how do you teach that skill if, if you can yeah, so I hear I heard a lot in my journey. Hey, get to the next ball. Uh, let it go. <laughs> what does that mean? What does that mean? I want to let it go, but all my thoughts are telling me how awful I am, how I'm blowing it, how I'm not going to start the next game, how, you know, uh, I'm not going to make the trip for USA. It's not like a button you can push or a knob you can turn. And so that's why I'm like speaking to athletes and teams right now. This is where you build the foundation. You have no time to practice. Good. Build the foundation for your team to be so relentless and so gritty, not only when things are good, but when things are bad. And so you have a team on the court where it's like, yeah, I can call timeout, but you know what? They have the tools that they need to get through this. They're not going to give up runs because they're going to consistently get back to the next ball. How do you get back to the next ball for me? Again, we got to work on mindfulness. We got to work on meditation. We have to train this as a team. Um, again, this is what Alan's doing. He's having so much success with it at Long Beach State. Um, and then for me, you know, I spent a season dealing with shame, a lot of shame. Uh, as I said, when I was younger, I had this growth mindset instilled by my parents. When I got to Brazil, Brazil really doesn't care about growth mindset. I don't think they've read Carol Dweck yet. And so if I make a couple of mistakes, the coach is like throwing a tantrum, like to the audience, the audience, you know, going to the audience, like, oh, this guy, I don't know. I'm like, well, all the players are like this too. Like, oh, that's it. Oh, and I'm just like, they like shook me and threw me back into a fixed mindset. So not only for the end of that year in Brazil, it was really tough. I came to the game just hoping not to fail. And yeah, sometimes the games did go well, but if it started off bad, well, you know, shame. In France, I had an amazing environment. All my teammates were great. I didn't really understand my coach, but he was supportive. And everyone wanted me to succeed. But you know what? If I started off bad, I took back the only power I believed I had, and that was to punish myself. And I'm sure a lot of coaches out there have kids like that. We were like, it's okay. Come on. Like, you got it. But those kids are just like, they just feel like they need to punish themselves. They need to shame themselves because if they do it and they punish, they attack themselves, then they, their hope is that no one else will. And that was like in Brazil. It's like, oh, he's shaming himself. Good. He learned his lesson. I'm not going to tell him. You know, when I got to France and that wasn't the situation and the environment, I was just cutting off my own legs. And so I had, to, I had to flip it. How do I flip it? I flipped it with an elevated emotional state. And so going on the court, I kind of have this ritual that uh, people are always curious, like, what are you doing? Because I'll, I'll take a knee and put my hands on the ground. And I'll say a couple things to start the match and any time after the timeout, I'll say, uh, thank you so much for this opportunity. No place I'd rather be. So gratefulness, elevated emotional state. Next one, with my 10 fingers, I'll touch the floor. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Joy, elevated emotional state. Uh, only for the beginning of the sets, I'll say I'm loved, I'm safe, I'm enough. Love. And the last thing I say, and uh, I still don't know what I believe in, uh, whether it's Krishna, Buddha, God, universe, my higher self, but I believe that there's uh, some sort of creator, someone that's guiding me on my path. And I'll just say, thank you so much for continuing to guide me in love and light, trust. So four big elevated emotional states that I carry with me on the court, where instead of going back to the court, like, it's like, I get to be there. 
I get to have this challenge. I'm playing, I'm in six against Sokolov. That's right. Like I want to be there. And then the other thing for me that I, I slowly tried to flip was like, if I'm on the court and I'm dealing with the shame, usually it's like, Oh, don't serve me. Don't serve me. Or like, Oh God, this guy got me last time. I flip it. And it's like a fake it until you make it where I'm like, freaking serve me the ball, serve me the ball. Like, or it would be like, oh, just hit my seam. I dare you. I'm going to nail it. You're going to, I know you're trying to hit my outside too, but you're going to hit the seam and I'm going to nail it. And so like this insane belief in myself and this arrogance, because, uh, what was it? Ford said, it. it's like, whether you believe it, uh, you believe you can or can't, you're right. Yep. No, that's, I, I think the power of ritual, the power of elevated states, fake it till you make it. I, I mean, these are all great tools that every coach and every player should be aware of, no doubt about it. I, I, I love your personal rituals. I, I Those are some of the first times I've, I've seen you do some of these things, but definitely now I, now I understand the 10 fingers one. I love that one. Definitely going to use that one in the future without a doubt. It's huge for those watching. Just try it. Say thank you, thank you 10 times. And you just feel you get happier. And yeah. so for me, when I go back on the court that year in France, the first half, Oh man, I'm blowing it like catastrophizing, right? I'm blowing it. I'm going to get fired. Like I'm not going to travel with USA this year. And this was the year for USA where I, I, I got to play. I played in the finals, uh, in the worldly finals. Eric got hurt. I played my two best games ever. And that whole first half of the season, I was playing awful with shame. But again, as we talked before, these moments were like our, our butts on fire. That's where we have to change. We have to be more creative. And so it was a huge change for me because maybe I got aced two times in a row. We call a timeout. I kind of go with my head down like, oh, sorry, guys, you know, sorry, sorry. But I go back on the court. It's like, thank you so much for this opportunity. No place I'd rather be. And it's like, yeah, like, you know what? It's already happened. Now I have this opportunity, no matter, you know, what happened before. I have this opportunity in front of me to be great. And that's what I want. I want the opportunity to see how I do against these great players. Great. Let's go. Yeah, I think just the whole idea of just being present in the moment and appreciating where we are, like I said before, just the idea that I have a cup, you know, I'm here, I get to play a great sport with great people in a great situation, you know, I think it's something that a lot of coaches and players just simply forget and, you know, I just, and, and we should be, you know, enthusiastic about it and, and love that sport, you know, and just love the people around us without a doubt. Um, so, my question next for you, and we don't have a ton of time to go into this, but I am curious is, you obviously have a lot of different um, different aspects that you take into your understanding about the self and the mindfulness. Um, you mentioned some Stoicism, some Buddhism, um, some other sects and ideas as well. Um, what could you teach either a coach or a player, maybe a quick meditation tool to recenter ourselves that you use or a breathing exercise you use? Um, that's you know close to a ritual, but something you could teach us quickly or something that works for you. Yeah. I mean, again, there's no, there's no button you can push. There's no knob you can dial, but uh, it, it goes back to just what I've learned through meditation. Uh, I first started with an app. I used the app for like five years. And then finally, through the help of a friend, uh, I found out about this thing called Vipassana. What is Vipassana? Vipassana is a, a 12 day, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say retreat because it's not very glamorous, a 12 day stint where for 10 days, the only four things you can do is meditate walk eat and sleep can't speak can't look anyone in the eye can't journal you have to hand over your phones your computer everything you meditate for 10 or 11 hours a day and so after this i kind of realized like i, I think i have uh, earned not to use an app anymore and so the big thing for me is focusing and moving my consciousness again right we want to be in the eye of the tornado because kind of the tornado is like all these thoughts right and uh, we're not going to go into thoughts, but, you know, Buddha says thoughts think themselves. What we're learning from evolutionist uh, psychologists is there's these mental modules, these seven sub-selves, and they're the one thinking the thoughts. Mm -hmm. Thoughts really aren't actually ours because most of them are so limited. Why would we have these limited thoughts, right? And so realizing that we're thinking, we're getting swept up, just observing for a little bit, letting them pass. And then going back to the sensation of the breath moving in and out of our nostrils, moving our consciousness from this tornado to the eye of the tornado, which is in our breath. And I think that's the biggest thing, be able to breathe, but easier said than done. If someone cuts you off, honk, you know, 
if uh, you stub your toe, you say the F word, you know, this is reaction. So we have to build it. We have to build it. And we build it in my, in my experience through sitting on a meditation pillow for five, 10 minutes every day. At the end, uh, at the beginning, the end in Poland, I would meditate for an hour a day. And you know what happened? Played the best ball of my life. I had the best year I've ever played because I just went all in to everything I could control. And a lot of that was meditation. You know, at the end of the day, I can spend an hour on Instagram. Why not just 20 minutes on Instagram and I can spend an hour meditating. And you know what? The more you put in, you know, the more you're going to get out. This is absolutely true. I can say this, uh, you know, for just playing the game of volleyball, touching as much as possible and meditation, you're going to get so much out of it. Yeah. And I, I agree with you. I, 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 you know, I've talked to so many players in the past and still do about, you know, let's try, I know it's hard, but let's try to remove some of those social media clicks and likes away and get rid of that, you know, that dopamine challenge that we like, and let's, you know, be a little bit more mindful. Let's try some meditation. And we've done that. We've done some great yoga. We've done some transcendental stuff, some Buddhist stuff, some stoicism stuff, and they enjoy it, but being mindful to place some time on it and reflect, I think is huge huge and I, I myself have found it very very resourceful and a, a great you know um thing to have in my bag of tools without a doubt um so i guess the next part that i'd like to talk to you about and you talked about this in your last bio to me was this idea of a whole foods diet and again a lot of people talk about i eat healthy i eat this this and this this is what a good diet is so what is your idea of a whole foods diet for a volleyball player, you know, like yourself and how do you prep for that? Yeah. Whole food plant-based diet. And so what that means for me, you know, it could be other, it can be other stuff. Uh, uh, a guy that I've lived with for the past four years is uh, Max Holt. And uh, you know, I've been, I've been plant-based for eight years and just me being naive, but also wanting to help. And maybe a little bit of my ego. I'm like, Max, you gotta try it. You gotta try it. And he's like, don't tell me what to do. Like, you can do your thing. Like, I'll do mine. You know, do your thing. I'll do mine. And eventually we started living together. And I was like, all right, well, I'm going to cook. because You're not going to cook me any good, like, whole food plant-based uh, dinners. So I started cooking for him. And, uh, you know, he started feeling great. Less inflammation, less pain, less ibuprofen. And that's for me, you know, that is a whole food plant-based diet. Having more sustained energy and a quicker recovery time because you're eating from the ground. You're eating as close as you can from the sun, our energy source. And so for me, what that looks like is uh, I love doing smoothie bowls in the morning. Uh, you know, I like to make a green smoothie bowl, maybe a lot of kale, spinach, combine a couple frozen bananas, some dates, um, maybe a little oats, uh, cinnamon, almond butter, blend that together on top, a bunch of fresh fruit, some sprouted granola, and just fueling myself. Um, as much as I can, I love to go to matcha rather than coffee. Coffee is a stimulant. It's going to have a, it's going to have a negative impact on our adrenaline glands and just trying to eat clean from the ground, abstaining from, um, animal sources, whether it be the meat of animals, fish, cow, pig, or, uh, you know, dairy and cheese. Yeah. You know, I, I do think there is, you can be thriving like plant-based where you eat a little other, uh, Max, he won't use the V word, which I love because I think too often we are so tribal. And so I know Max, you know, in Italy, when he goes out to eat, maybe he'll have some fish. Uh, maybe once in a while, he'll have a nice cut of meat. But when he's home, he eats all plant-based and he feels amazing. He told me last year it was the best his body's ever felt. It was the oldest he's ever been. Doesn't have to take really any ibuprofen. And that's what I love, you know, sustained health, real health. And, uh, I love to speak about it, but I realized that the best way to speak about it is just to put my hand forward. And if someone wants to take it, I'll be happy to tell them what has worked for me. But uh, when I first got into it, like I said with Max, I was like, God, you got to know this is so great. But, you know, the ego is going to resist that and resent that. And so if people want to learn more, I'm always happy to share the benefits, you know, but uh, I kind of fell into it by accident. I picked up a book and again, on accident, I thought it was about motivation. This guy's a memoir. A book called Finding Ultra. Rich Roll has a great podcast now. He's gone more into mindfulness and business. Uh, but everything started to change. Just, you know, something with my face. I've always had acne. And as soon as I went plant-based, acne, done. Uh, I still hit the same numbers in the weight room. And at that time, for those old, older coaches, I was working and playing with Damien Scott, Eric Vance. Damien's a 6'5 ex-football player at UCLA. 
Eric Vance, his dad played professional rugby, big guys. And I was able to keep up with him on a plant-based diet. And after that, I was like, okay, like, let's see what happens some more. Cause I was still learning about it. I was just going full into it. And uh, then I read China study and talked about the correlation between, you know, over or under 15% of casein protein in your diet and how that uh, affects your ability to have heart disease, uh, get cancer, diabetes. And my family has always had a big problem with cholesterol. And so after that, I was like, yeah, easy. My dad has gone plant-based, mom's gone plant-based, both brothers went plant-based and we're thriving. You know, the food is more colorful. There's so many different textures. And I can't say enough. It's changed my life. Absolutely changed my life. Again, for those older coaches that played against me in college, you know, I was a punk. I was a guy at the net pointing fingers with a headband, cursing everyone out and going plant-based. You know, I just naturally become uh, more compassionate and just a lot of different ways. It's affecting me in a positive way. Uh, but at the same time, you know, food is something that's very dear to people's heart, very dear to the ego. You know, how dare you tell me that you know a better way? And so, again, I always try to be careful. If they want to know more, I'm happy to share. But uh, I try to be as um, patient as I can uh, by not telling someone what to do or forcing them to, to join me. Yeah, I, I agree. Food definitely tends to be a little sensitive subject to a lot of people, very cultural based. But yeah, I mean, if you're willing to learn and look at the science behind it, it makes a whole lot of sense. Um, I've talked to a couple other national team coaches and, you know, um, uh, you know, people that have played overseas, uh, and definitely when you see it on uh, the World uh, the World Cup or the Grand Prix, I've heard some pretty crazy stories about, all right, guys, we're going over this country. We need to pack our food with us because we're not going to eat the food over there because <laughs> the turnaround time's too fast and we can't risk it. Do you have any cool, crazy culture where we're not going to eat the food over there? Not because we don't trust them, but just because we're afraid our bodies – can't acclimate to it that fast. So we're just going to bring a bunch of canned tuna. I've heard crazy stories like that before. China. We went to China. We couldn't bring, yeah. we couldn't eat the meat. You know, we weren't going to eat the meat. So everyone brought like these camping lunches. And I was just like laughing, died. I was like, because <laughs> they had great, they had great uh, plant-based options. And a lot of guys were went plant-based. And I was joking because the previous year, the first stop we went, we were in Serbia and we went 0-3. And, and in China, most of the guys were eating plant-based. Some of the guys like uh, David Smith, brought like these like camp lunches and he was eating meat but we went three you know and so it was kind of funny just kind of joking around like uh, yeah uh, I don't know <laughs> when, when I when I travel you know I'm, I'm uh, I've learned you know especially starting off vegan in France or it's just like you know what they don't even know what that word means and so when I travel I'll actually bring my blender bring some bananas I'll always have an avocado for meal just in case you know just in case because uh, I want to feel the best way I can when I travel, I want to make sure it's as close as home as possible for me. So I'll bring like my goofy blue light blockers, you know, I'll bring some different teas with me and make sure I get to bed in the round same time. And so I always want to give myself the best foundation to be great in the game. And that has to do a lot with my ability to prepare. Fair enough. No, thank you. Yeah, Dustin, I'm just going to wrap up with a couple, um, you know, closing remarks for myself and I'll give you the last word to talk to the coaches that are out there. Anything else? you want to say and i know you have a couple other places we can see you um but just want to remind everybody in the jiva world may 10th is the last day for regional nominations for regional director of the year boys coach of the year girls coach of the year and abca and jiva are adding two new awards this year we're calling one the networks award and another one the innovation award um, please take a look at the nomination forms you can find those on the jiva website under the junior section I, uh, I do want to thank the behind the scenes social media director for Jiva, Aaron LeBan. Aaron, you did an awesome job tonight. She was taking care of you guys on Facebook. Um, and without a doubt, we're going to have another great for you, uh, great show for you next week. We have Kayla Principato and Katrina Jansen, both players from their prospective countries, high performance programs. Katrina Jansen went through the Australian high performance model from a junior to now a professional. And Kayla Principato went from the USA Jiva high performance model to now a player and professional overseas. So really cool seeing how two countries come together in their high performance pipeline. Um, Dustin, with that said, um, I enjoyed a lot. I know we kind of did what I'll call like you know, uh, we touched a lot of different subjects and I know we could have talked to about any of those subjects for a lot longer, yeah. um, but I'll leave you to say, hey, you're available to do this for other people, other clubs, organizations. 
Um, what are your closing remarks? And if a club wants to get a hold of you, how do they do so? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, this situation has been wild. I, when I first got back from Poland, I was working on a, a passing course, just kind of write down my thoughts. And so a lot of my time was spent connecting with clubs, uh, just, you know, helping their players have a different perspective on this time and growing. Uh, after doing a while of that, colleges started reaching out to me and they're like, hey, we'll, we'll pay you to speak to our kids about mindfulness. I was like, I can talk about mindfulness. And uh, it's been amazing. Uh, you know, last week I've been connecting with uh, a lot of the Adidas teams, being an Adidas athlete, working with them. Um, but you know what? It's just fun because uh, what I've found, a lot of coaches, you know, it's, it's not new. I'm not like this, like a uh, mindfulness Jesus, you know, minus the hair. Uh, but a lot of coaches don't do this already. And they're talking to the kids, whether it's club or colleges, but what the coaches are saying, is just the players are so resistant, right? It's like, all right, mom, like, all right, dad, I'll journal or like, yeah, I'll meditate. But when I go in there, you know, I like to speak to them as an equal, not as someone above, not as USA Dustin, but as an athlete who's so passionate and curious about a better way. And an athlete that has failed so many times that the only option was to be more creative, more intentional of how I work. And giving them the tools, especially those kids that, as I mentioned before, that will do anything. You know, you have those kids that will run through a wall, but you don't have to do that anymore. When I was a kid, I just bumped the ball off the wall every day. All right. I wish I could have known that I could meditate. I could journal. I could be more intentional. I could have more space when things aren't going well for me on the court. Be tougher. And not only as an individual, have teams be tougher. And for them to overperform, consistently overperform because they're so mentally tough. And so right now is the perfect time to learn about what's really within our control. Those things that are not completely within our control and that are making us suffer and siphon our energy and confidence from pursuing those things that can help us grow. And so, yeah, I'm open to talk with any uh, club, college coach. Uh, I've been doing two or three Zooms a day. Uh, I'm Zooming my eyeballs out at the end of the day. My eyes hurt so much, but it's so rewarding. The messages I get from players and coaches and, uh, I'm just so blessed that I finally get to use my uh, Long Beach State communication degree in my life. And so, uh, yeah, you know, it's been great too. And not just that, but the conversations I've had with coaches leading up to the calls, because there's so many great coaches out there that are realizing all these different edges outside, especially with mindfulness. And so the conversations I've had with the coaches are amazing. Conversations I've had with the teams are amazing. And just helping the coaches hammer down the points that they believe are so uh, influential to their team's success. Awesome. Oh, sorry. Dustin Watton at gmail.com. Easy. You can reach me on Facebook or Instagram too. And then, uh, we just set up a call and see how I can be of service. Maybe there's a possibility where I'm not of service, but every phone call I've had, it's led to a zoom and it's been rewarding. Really rewarding. Awesome. No, Dustin, I'll say, you know, the conversation we have beforehand, the emails exchange we have back and forth, uh, you know, I, I love what you have to talk about. I think you have a lot of great information from, you know, that player's side. Um, and you do, you, you do a nice job of presenting it in a way that's going to be effective towards players. And I've heard a lot of players and parents say to teachers, hey, they don't listen to me, but they listen to you. And if you're that voice from outside coming in, sometimes that's what kids need and they need that new voice. So again, you know, thank you so much for your time. Another great addition at Jeeva Live. Couldn't appreciate it more. And thank you very much for the discussion. I appreciate it, Dustin. My brother, thank you so much for having me. And hopefully we can connect again. I, I mean, I enjoyed your thoughts, not only here, but before. And so I love to connect offline, online. You know, I love your thoughts too. So thank you for allowing me uh, to be of service. Thank you. Pleasure. Good night, Jiva. <laughs>